in a previous life, I was a secondary English teacher. So I'm a born educator. Um, I, I've got a great passion to kind of help people, to serve people, to educate people, to really allow people to understand um, what it is that they're looking to do and what they're looking to achieve. Now that allowed me to kind of step into the property education space as well. So in 2016, um, Inside Liverpool was born under a different title um, and it's gone through some, some changes and things over time. But ultimately it was about educating people to give, um, to empower them, I guess, to give them the information, the guidance, the support that they need to feel confident to go and invest in our city sensibly. So that's exactly what we're going to be doing today. Now, I'm a scouser, as you can tell from the accent. Please do try and stay um, stay up stay up to date. Please do try um, to keep up. If you need a coffee, by all means, go and get yourself one. Um, but being a scouser means that I also get to connect with people here in a way that maybe um, you found a little bit difficult in the past. So Liverpool is very much built on relationships and, and networks. And when we first started um, kind of dipping our toes in the property market in 2009, when we became landlords, right through to 2016, when I built these additional businesses, these um, education businesses, what happened was the, you know, in that time frame, I had to work really hard to build the right relationships with the right people. And we've had to kiss a lot of frogs along the way. OK, my husband's dealt with a huge amount of tradespeople um, and we hire fast and we, you know, we fire, we fire fast as well. Um, and you have to go through a certain growth periods within your businesses to find those right people around you. And now um, that network that I have is, you know, people from all walks of life in the property space, estate agents, letting agents, um, solicitors, mortgage brokers, um, surveyors, builders, painters and decorators, gas engineers, electricians, the lot, everything you can possibly need in a property business, I've now built into that network. And so by working with us, you you tap into that network. We We kind of provide a safety net, I guess, is the way to explain it. And I do know a lot of good people here. And absolutely, if I don't know the answer to something, I can always connect you with the person that can. So why am I doing all of this? Um, one of the, as I said before, I'm a born educator. And one of my um, big missions is to improve the um, Liverpool property market. I think over time, I've noticed a huge number of houses that are in incredibly poor state of repair, tenants in very, very difficult positions. And, um, you know, someone who, who's who got a family themselves, I understand that when you've got children, um, you know, your home is your castle. And there's an awful lot of tenants, unfortunately, who are in, you know, pretty squalid conditions. So when we started to build um, our single buy to let portfolio, we had very clear ideas about what we wanted to achieve. And I always wanted to have quality over quantity. Now, you can go out and build a portfolio of 100 um, single bike lets if that's what you want to do. But um, when you move at that kind of pace and that kind of scale, what happens, unfortunately, is standards slip a little bit. Now, I'm a great believer in the path of least resistance. I want, you know, a quieter life. I want a slower pace of life. I don't want to be involved in, you know, the day to day um, kind of goings on in every single property. And so it didn't seem sensible to build a portfolio of 100 plus single by lets that were in pretty poor condition. Instead, I wanted to buy a smaller portfolio that was much better quality. And so our standard um, kind of three bedroom terraces let currently for around about 650 to 675 pounds um, per calendar month against, you know, the bigger landlords who are sitting on portfolios that rent for maybe 550 a month because they can't keep up and they can't keep those standards up. Now, we went into this market, um, you know, back in kind of in 2009, when we first started, we didn't intend to go and build a portfolio. By about 2010, we started to realise that that was a sensible thing to do. And slowly but surely, we've added, um, you know, single by left after single by left. And we've built a portfolio that we're extremely proud of. And um, the tenants that are in those properties, they don't hassle us, you know, a huge amount. We don't get endless maintenance issues or anything like that. We get high quality tenants who pay their rent on time. During COVID, I had one tenant who missed two rent payments. Um, and that was because she'd been laid off kind of temporarily and also her husband's at the same time. Within two months, though, she'd caused herself back up to date. She made those back payments and then she continued to run the tenancy in the way that she always had done before, you know, to a really good standard, everything on time. And I, I think that's, you know, that comes from a, a lot of hard work on our part, but also having good relationships with our tenants and also understanding, you know, the regulation and the compliance and all that size of things. So there's an awful lot you need to learn when it comes to property. And that's I kind of bridge that gap for you of giving you a shortcut and giving you a network of people. 
So that's me in a nutshell. So let's move on to um, the presentation and explain a few things to you. So before I move on, um, I'll just make reference to our website because there's an awful lot of stuff on there. You know, we've got limited time today, but we can um, we can cover a certain amount. The rest of it, you can probably go and find on our website. So our website is www.inside-liverpool.co.uk. And if you use the, the tag there, forward slash R stroke services, um, that will tell you basically everything that we do and what you can get from us. Now, I definitely recommend that you go and download one of our free guides or all three of our free guides. These are fantastic. The postcodes guide um, gives you a, an overview to the city. The shopping guide gives you an idea of the kinds of standards that you should be um, creating a single buy to let to, you know, the, the kinds of things that we buy that we put in our own properties to give it that really good standard and get that 650, 675 rent. And then there's also a couple of um, blog posts in there that I think everybody should um, should read if they think about investing in Liverpool, like the three blog posts, the, the three best blog posts that you need to read. Um, so please do go and check out our website. You get loads of stuff on there. Um, the free guides is a really good start. And then if you're um, quite new to our world, another good little um, kind of thing to get in is this Kickstarter course, this five steps to successful buy to let. So we run a five week program, um, a five, sorry, a five step program where we teach you how to go and find a house, um, you know, how to go and find the right house, how to understand about the areas, how to add value to the house and how to put the right tenants in. So that walks you through that process. Um, and it's absolute steal. It's £99 currently, but it is the last time that we're running it live for £99 on um, May 17th. So if you're interested in that and you think what we've covered today is a, is a good little insight into my world, please do come and hang out with me um, for another five weeks as well. So let's see, guys. Um, I definitely start, if you're quite new to all this, I definitely start having a browse of our YouTube channel. Um, there's so much stuff on there. There's videos that we've built up, um, you know, for, for kind of two, three years or so we've been adding to that channel. And what we've started to do is just kind of touch on some thoughts that you've probably had yourself, like how do you do buy refurb refinance in Liverpool? If I've got 50k, where should I go off to invest that money? to get the best returns in the city. Um, looking at maybe HMOs, is this a good area for HMO? All those questions that are going around in your head, they're probably answers on our YouTube channel. So please do go and check that out. Um, and give us a little like and a subscribe, of course. Add to my ego. <laughs> I totally want more subscribers on our YouTube channel. Um, but it's a really good starting point. You can just put me in your ears and you can, um, you know, you can go for your daily walk or commute to work or whatever. So one of the questions that I get asked the most um, when people are interested in investing in Liverpool is this, where is good to invest in Liverpool? Now, it's a really difficult question to answer when I don't know that much about you. So if you're just sending this message to me, you know, on a DM or something, I don't know anything about you, unfortunately. And it's really difficult for me to give advice when we don't know the context, we don't understand a bit more about you and your expertise and that kind of thing. So I need you to think about it yourself in this kind of like matrix. I want you to think of these four areas um, and know that you can't get all four of them. So what's the most important thing to you? Are you looking to buy a cheap house? Are you moving um, your finances to Liverpool because it's cheap to get in the market? You know, it's it's a, it's a good kind of starting point from, from a buy to let point of view. Are you looking for something that doesn't need much maintenance? Are you operating from afar? Maybe you're abroad, maybe you're down south and you can't really be dealing with maintenance complaints every single month. So maybe you're looking for something that's got more minimal maintenance. So Liverpool was built on Victorian terraces, um, many of which are damp, <laughs> really, really damp houses and roof issues because they've got the Victorian slates on. So maybe you need to look at something that's a little bit of a newer um, property, something not a new build as such, but maybe something built in the last 30 or 40 years or so that will give you maybe better maintenance um, or less maintenance issues. Maybe you're somebody who's looking for long-term tenants. You, you don't want any void periods. You're really hoping that a family will move in and stay there for five or six years or so. And you don't, then don't have to worry about marketing the property again and having those void periods. I think that's a really successful business model because you can just set and forget and your house just um, you know brings the money in every single month. Or maybe you're really focused on capital uplift. You've seen that Liverpool has got a lot of regeneration. It's got a lot of um, things going for it in terms of, you know, the plans for the next five years, 10 years or so. And it's the capital uplift that you're hoping for. So please don't buy just for capital uplift, but know that some parts of the city are likely to go up more so than other parts of the city. So I need you to understand which of those four is the most important to you. And when you know that, you can start to realise, you know, the certain parts of the city that lends itself better to each of these because you don't get all four. <laughs> um, another thing is, let's be totally honest here, when we're looking at, you know, the, the income and things, 
um, yield is positively correlated with headaches and hassle. <laughs> so the more kind of, the higher the yield, you know, if your property, if you farm something and you think your property is going to be bringing in 9, 10, 11, 12, 13% yields or something like that, there's a very good chance there's going to be a lot of headaches that go with that property. And you need to be prepared for those. So I'm not saying don't buy them. Absolutely, I've got some fantastically yielding properties, but they come with extra responsibilities sometimes. So we've got some blocks of flats, for example, which are still single by lets because they're individual units. Tenants manage the house just like, um, sorry, manage the flat just like they would a house. And you might have three, four, five in the one building. And the yield on some of those is like, on one of them, it's about 13%, which is phenomenal. Um, but they come with certain extra things to worry about. So we have greater compliance. We need to have um, every six months we have to do fire alarm checks. We have to do emergency lighting checks. We have to do, um, you know, the, there's three boilers within the one building. There's only one roof, which is a good thing, but there's three boilers still. Um, we've got tenants who are in various different situations. So we've got one guy who's got mental health issues and every kind of six to 12 months or so he falls off the wagon and he needs a little bit of extra support from me um, as his managing agent as well. So different things will happen in different people's lives and what you'll tend to find is in the cheaper houses, in the higher yield areas, you're going to have tenants who need some additional um, help and support. And if you're prepared to do that, fantastic. If that's not your bag and um, you know you want to pay an agent to do it, the agent will likely charge you more money. So maybe the overall income isn't as high as you first thought. And then the other thing that I really want to drill home today is about artificial capital uplift. So capital uplift is something people ask for a lot um, and they're looking for the next, you know, the next area in Liverpool. But I'd be conscious of really kind of doing your homework around the history of that area and the history of the property price in that area. So we're starting to see some artificial capital uplift created by investors. So there's pockets, there's areas in our city where investors have jumped in quite quickly and the prices have gone up and up and up. And you have to be aware of this because um, buying something today might be based on, you know, a bit of a bubble that's about to pop or about to burst. And we need to be careful about that. So we're going to be looking at toll prices to understand that market really carefully. So this is um, this is the guy that I mentioned, this is the guy with the mental health issues. So um, every now and again, he falls off the wagon and he starts to do strange things that we have to kind of step in and become a little bit more of a social worker almost with him and help work with him to kind of get the place tidied up. So I don't veto anywhere in our city. I think there's a lot of good areas in the city. I think there's a lot of areas where you're going to be very um, kind of hands on. You're going to need to roll your sleeves up and get involved and in this being one of them. So um that's why it's easier for me when I work with you more closely on a one-to-one -one level or I get to know you within one of our paid for groups. I get to understand a little bit more about your capacity or your experience and whether you're ready to handle this kind of thing. And if you're not, then I can direct you elsewhere and I can give you a much safer kind of investment. So I don't veto anywhere. I just say you need to know what you're getting yourself into. So because this is obviously a, a public forum, um, I need to be careful what, what kind of areas I suggest to you and things that I want to say. So a lot of the generic advice that I give are around some of the safer postcodes, the areas like Old Swan in L13 and um, part of Toxteth in L8 and then um, specifically around Derby Park in the Buchle area up north. Um, and then at the end of this presentation, I'll also give you some little insider tips, some little kinds of little golden nuggets from me to take away that you can apply to any postcode um, or any area in our city. Okay, so we're going to start with L13. So you can see here on the map, um, basically these maps are taken from Rightmove. So if you just type in the postcode L13, it will give you this lovely boundary to show you where the postcode area ends and all those dots of houses that are for sale. Now, during the pandemic, we've lost a huge amount of stock. Um, you know, we're probably down um, something like 30% on the amount of houses for sale, which impacts, doesn't it, on, you know, how many are for sale. If we've got a lot of kind of um, investors that are keen to invest, we end up becoming motivated buyers sometimes because the competition's high. So um, these red kind of dots, it looks like an awful lot, but actually during the pandemic, that, that was, um, you know, we probably lost about a third of those. Now, each of our postcodes are generally split up into a few different areas. Now, it's not good enough to talk in postcodes, but that's how we start on that macro level and then we kind of zoom in. So in L13, you can see here, we've got just towards the north here, we've got Tubrook. 
Now, this is the cheapest part of L13, um, although prices have risen quite considerably in the last kind of 12 months or so. And the other thing to notice about Tubook is there's a bit more of a transient tenant type. They don't stay as long as they do in other parts of the city. Um, it's very well located. So you can see here the A5049 takes you directly into the city centre. You can get there within about 15 minutes or so on the bus. Um, the motorway network is also very close by. And, um, you know, the kinds of tenants that you've got here, often blue collar workers, sometimes tenants in receipts of housing benefits, low paid workers, um, not always on permanent contracts, basically. So a bit more of a transient neighbourhood. People don't um, stay here for long periods of time an awful lot unless um, their circumstances dictate. And if you look on something like Street Checker, one of the websites you can use, it'll give you a percentage of, you know, the, the number of renters compared to the number of owner occupiers, for example. And the number of renters in Tubrook is really quite high. Then we've got Old Swan, which is just here at the south. Um, Old Swan is the sweet spot, okay? Old Swan is that bit that sits in between Tubrook and Stonycroft from a price point of view, um, and it gives you that healthy return on investment, um, you know, for your, for your own figures. Now, because of the last maybe two years or so, prices have crept up quite quickly, and what you've started to see now is the two beds give a far better return on investment than the three beds do in Old Swan. So you've got two bed terraces around here um, that you can pick up, you know, currently in kind of May 21, you can pick these up for about 80 to 90k um, and they'll rent for about 525, something like that around there. And if you use this as your kind of central spot, you know, all, all along this road here, Prescott Road, that again takes you into the city centre, takes you out to the motorway network and the sweet spot around there is those two beds. Now, the three beds are much bigger houses and the three beds, um, over time, you will see greater capital growth from those three beds. So that's why I said at the start, know what it is that you're looking for. If you're looking for capital growth, you'll still get good rental income, but you'll, your chances of getting capital growth are greater with the three beds than the two beds. And arguably, you'll get better tenants as well than you would in the likes of Tubrook, for example. And then Stonycroft is the third part to it. Now, Stonycroft is more owner occupiers. Um, you often get gardens as well in Stonycroft, which is really quite nice. But obviously, the property prices are higher as well. So yes, you can get more rent because they're nicer houses and they've got gardens, but the yields will start to drop down quite considerably. So arguably, the tenants would be, you know, would be even better here than they would be in Old Swan, but um, and maybe stay even longer, you know, because of the the high um, number of owner occupiers, they might stay even longer. But how much you get in comparison to how much the houses are on that yield might be a little bit too low for some of you, especially if, you know, in your hometown, you can already get five or six percent. That's roughly what you're going to get there in Stonycroft. So if we zoom in to Old Swan, so this is here, and we're going to use this kind of triangle in the middle as our pin in the map. OK, we've got the Tesco Superstore, Aldi, um, Home and Bargain, love Home and Bargain. Um, we've got an Asda and right along this road, this Prescott Road, um, a whole host of shops and banks and chemists and all the amenities that you could possibly need. So Old Swan is a high street. Um, and anyone that knows me well, if there's an Aldi and there's a Costa, and there's a Costa just here somewhere, um, if there's an Aldi and a Costa nearby, it's somewhere you want to be buying houses. <laughs> um, it, it just works. It seems to be a sweet spot. And you start to see that if you think about it from a commercial point of view, Costa and Aldi and Lidl and a few of those supermarkets, they're doing the, the research for you. They're finding those kinds of tenants who shop in their shops. And those kinds of tenants who shop in their shops are often the tenants who want to rent houses. So um, over here on the left hand side, these are more two beds. So you can see the likes of Ronald, Herrick, Gidlow. You know, there are three beds there, but typically there's a lot more two beds. And over to the right hand side, you've got these like Pemberton, Fitzgerald, Dovercliff and what have you. And um, they're the three beds. Now, some of these like on Dovercliff, there's a couple with gardens. Um, and these three beds are quite big. They've got hallways, they've got um, bay windows, they've got high ceilings. The two beds, um, often the front door is directly on the pavement and they're a smaller, more narrow kind of house. But the return on investment with the two beds is a little bit better because the three beds are probably topping about 130 now. And we used to be like 90, 100, 110. Now they're topping about 130. So I thought it would be useful to show you some floor plans so you can really kind of get a feel for this. Now, this is um, a house that's for sale on Fitzgerald Road, so it needs some work, as you can see, um, but it's the floor plan I'm interested in. So these three beds around the likes of Fitzgerald, you come into the door here, 
and you've got a nice big wide hallway and then we've usually got two reception rooms and a kitchen um, with a door out to the back and it's not a garden it's just a yard and then upstairs you generally get the three bedrooms and a bathroom as well now you can see these bedrooms i mean look how big this is 11 by 11 um 11 foot by 11 inches by 12 foot four inches big huge rooms now, there's a lot that can be done in terms of configuration and things with these houses, but this layout is almost perfect. You don't need to do a huge amount to it at all. It's more of a cosmetic upgrade. And on these three bedrooms houses, you're probably looking to spend about 25K um, to do a really good refurbishment throughout. Now, if you compare that with the two beds, so this is one on Belfast Road. See, this one's up for 100. Now, we're, we're getting a bit high now in comparison to the three beds. Now, I don't wanna get bogged down by the actual prices because obviously everything changes. You might be watching this, you know, um, even in a year's time, for example, and property prices will change. But I want you to look at the difference between the two beds and the three beds. So the three beds, that three beds was 90K. Obviously it needs 25K of works. This two bed doesn't need work and is on for 100. And you've got to work out the sweet spot for you. Now. If you look at the two beds, you can see here, this one's got a bathroom downstairs and that's quite common in some of these houses. Now, what they've managed to do is also squeeze a shower room upstairs. So wherever possible, I would try and get your bathroom upstairs, but I don't want you to do that at the detriment of all of this yield and things, because in some parts of the market, if everywhere on that street has got a downstairs bathroom, then tenants are okay with this, they don't mind. And bear in mind that we're only charging, you know, 500, 525 rent. They're not expecting, you know, the, the rates. They, they get that that low rent comes with, you know, some, some areas for negotiation. And a ground floor bathroom is sometimes the case. So some people have squeezed one in here at the detriment of some bedrooms. It's up to you whether you think that's a good idea. Now, I don't think it's sensible to try and convert this two bed into a three bed. Don't try and squeeze a third bedroom in here. You're not really going to add any value to the house um, from a valuation point of view. Tenants are unlikely to pay a huge amount more because the house is a very small house. You can see from the outside, it's got no bays. Um, it's quite a narrow house when you compare it to the three beds. Personally, I like to keep the footprint as, you know, as similar as it was when I bought it to when I'm ready to rent it out um, or do a refinance. So there's quite a large difference. And again, I'm not getting bogged down with actual prices, but I want you to consider the difference between what can I buy in the two bed range and what can I buy in the three bedroom range. And I want you to do the figures on both to understand which is the best um, the best one for you. So I really like Old Swan. I think it's a fantastic, um, just to go back, I think it's a fantastic part of the market um, and prices have been slowly going up, but it's so central you can see why it appeals to so many people. 15 minutes to the city centre, 10 minutes to the motorway network, high streets at the top of the road. Um, we don't really use trains in Liverpool that much, so a reliance on the bus system along Prescott Roads, there's a bus every five minutes taking you wherever it is that you need to go. So really, really well located. Um, and we've got some properties in L13 and some of the investors that we work with in our mastermind programme have got properties in L13 and we do not struggle to get tenants in any of those. There's always demand. Um, from a tenant's perspective. So that's good. That's how you get, you know, that's how you cut down on your voids, isn't it? So the next part of the city I want to talk about is Bootle, um, because you may have read in the press um, or, or different kinds of journals and things that you might stay on top of. There's a lot of development in, in the north of the city. So Bootle is right up in the north, L20, um, moving into the likes of Litherlands, L21 and so on. And um, there's, a, there's a development which is taking place, which is going to connect Bootle, L20, right the way down the dock road to the city centre. And it's a 10 year grand plan. And it's all based around the dock area here and it's um, carried out by the Peel Ports. Um, and they're the guys who are behind the Manchester Trafford Centre. So they're really, you know, they're really good developers. They know exactly what they're doing. And the plan is a 10 year plan. Covid aside, we've obviously had some delays, but you can already start to see that some of the development has happened in the city centre. That sprawl is starting to happen. We're moving into L3, um, which is kind of more Vauxhall and this development. You can you can see the changes. And so some people have jumped into purchasing properties in Buchle in L20 because they're taking a bit of a punt. They're seeing this long term regeneration plan and they're starting to think, well, maybe if I buy something now, you know, in another eight years or so, when all this happens, then our houses are going to go massively in value. Now, yes, that, that is a definite argument, you know, and it, and it makes perfect sense. And it's quite good that, you know, Bootle has, has always been this kind of outsider town. Bootle comes under Sefton local authority. So it's always been seen as a little bit more of an outsider. And they do use trains and things around Bootle, you know, to get into the city centre. So this connection, this kind of Peel Ports development, this is going to connect the two, which is fantastic. 
The downside is that because so many people are wanting Seeker punts, the prices in Buchel have just shot up massively in the last um, year or two. And we're starting to see that maybe, um, you know, sold prices and the prices on the market today, there's a real discrepancy. And if you purchase something in cash, maybe at the auctions or direct to vendor or, you know, whatever it might be, and then you're looking to refinance, you might get your figures a little bit wrong because the valuers are looking at the sold prices, the guaranteed done deals and the market's moving so fast that sometimes those prices don't keep up with how much you've paid today so that's this is the area of the artificial capital growth that i mentioned before so let's have a little look at the map and um, because again l20 has got kinds of sections to it. it's got three sections to it similar to l13 so we're going to go across this time instead of up and down we're going to start with the docks over here so from the area of the docks right up to stanley road which is just here this white road kind of cuts down the middle so this section is the cheapest part of Buchel. Um, but prices are creeping up as they have been, um, you know, in other parts of the city, but more so probably because of this um, development. And this part of the market still looks really attractive to uneducated investors because um, when they don't have a point of reference and they don't know how much, you know, a two bed was selling for only six months ago, if they find it very hard to know what to pay today. So some of these houses that have traditionally been like 45, 50k houses for a long time are now on the market for 17, 75. Whether that's right or wrong, it's not for me to judge. I just want you to know that we always need to be looking at that six month, you know, sole price in the last six months. The market is moving fast and if you want to get in i understand that you might want to pay a little bit more to kind of get your foot in the door but equally we don't want a situation where you end up in negative equity if there's some kind of correction or crash i've been there i've got my fingers burned please don't um and again oops and again we have a, a more transient neighborhood similar to tubrook and l13 we do get the transient tenants because this is quite um barren some of this area it's quite industrialized you know the, there isn't that kind of cohesive community feel like you get in some of the parts of the city um and other parts of Buchle even so certain tenants um you know will you know you'll get tenant churn certain tenants will not feel comfortable here at all so they'll move every six months or so and it can feel a little bit grotty it can feel a bit gray and a bit industrial and it does get some antisocial behavior because there's a lot of open spaces places for kids to hang around that kind of thing so you know again not saying don't buy here i'm just saying know what you're getting into understand that the yield probably comes with a few headaches you might get some antisocial behavior which could impact on your tenants so just be careful with that and then then we've got between stanley road and hawthorne road so stanley road was this one that kind of um, runs down the middle and then hawthorne road is just that next white road along it's a it's a fairly narrow section of the map and um, but that's almost like the middle ground that feels like the sweet spot again for return on investment because property prices are quite healthy um, and rents are quite healthy so you you know you could get a three beds rented at 600 and you could pick it up for about 90k or there or there about 90 to 100k um what I'd say here that's maybe slightly different to L13 though is L13, two bed sweet spot, Bootle, let's go for the three beds because we need to de-risk a little bit. Yeah, this is artificial capital growth, some of this. Um, we don't know, we're taking a punt. We don't know that this 10 year plan is gonna pay off in exactly the way we hope. So let's mitigate some of that risk by buying a better house in the first place, buying a bigger house, yeah, undoubtedly. The more house that you've bought, you know, the more you can get for your money, the better. So I personally, I prefer to stick to three beds around this area, unless you're getting the two beds for an absolute steal. Obviously, if you're getting it for an absolute bargain, that's fine. But you don't want to be paying 75k for a two bed when you could get a three bed for 90 to 95k and arguably get way better tenants, tenants that stay longer and greater capital growth. It might not make sense to do that. And then the sweet spot, the nice little area here, Derby Park, one of my most favourite little parts of Bootle. Within about a quarter of a mile of Derby Park is a really good place to start your investment journey. They're quite sensible houses, sensible tenants, sensible rent, sensible prices. Prices are creeping up, so don't wait too long. Um, and again, anywhere kind of moving inland, it, it's just getting better. Arguably, the tenant quality is getting better. And again, it comes back to the number of owner occupiers. So if you look around Street Check It again, you can see around this area, there's um, there's a school, St. Monica's, which is an oversubscribed primary school. Um, and for that reason alone, people will move into the area and stay longer and, and people tend to settle. And they can buy houses in this area for, you know, pretty sensible prices for owner occupiers. Some of them have got gardens as well, should have said that. So they're the kind of areas within Bootle. So very similar to the three kinds of sections in um, L13. 
So if you um, kind of zoom right into Derby Park and, and get a quarter mile radius um, kind of around there, that's a pretty nice little place to sit in the market. Just down here towards the south, you can see Sydney Road, Gonville Down and Clare. These are the um, still falling kind of just about into that sweet spot. But, you know, as I say, if you're watching this in a year's time, we, we might have moved on considerably with prices. But Derby Park is a nice part of the city. It's a nice place to hang out on a sunny day. And um, the park's, you know, the park's quite attractive. So if we compare, again, looking at the, um, the floor plans, if we compare the different houses. So this is a three bedroom house on Hawthorne Road. So Hawthorne Road is just here, as we say, right next to Derby Park, very close. Um, and you can see they're set back from the roads. They've got a small kind of um, gated entrance, you know, a step up to the house. You've got large bay windows upstairs and downstairs. So the house is quite big and quite grand. Um, and this is a typical layout. We've got a kind of a vestibule with a hallway generally again two reception rooms and then often um a, quite a large kitchen quite a long large kitchen and this might be a small yard area so don't expect anything you know fantastic but there is some outdoor space so you'll get this narrow passage and then you'll probably have something here at the end as well some nice space there turn it into a nice little patio it doesn't have to be extravagant and um, we've got a house on hawthorne roads and ours is just paved and it's got some um like uh, a rockery i think you'd call it like a little area where there's some bedding plants Upstairs, you've got a couple of bedrooms and you've got the bathroom up here. Now, my house on Hawthorne Road, which is not a million miles away from this house at all, actually had the bathroom downstairs to begin with. Now, if you remember, I said earlier on, don't go moving things unless you absolutely have to. So we didn't. What we did instead was there was upstairs, there was a toilet and sink. There wasn't a whole bathroom, but there was a toilet and sink. And it was very old and out of date. And then we had downstairs, we had the bathroom. Now, our bathroom was only a bath and a sink and upstairs was a toilet and a sink. So they separated them out, which was a bit nuts. So what we decided to do for ours, um, there's like a small, we had a, a like a, um, a back door here and it was like a small utility space. So we knocked it all through. So we, we bricked up the back door and we turned the whole um, space into a bigger bathroom. So we were able to get a toilet, a sink, a bath with a shower over. And it was a much nicer bathroom to have. And then upstairs, we had the toilet and sink and we maintained that. So if you're upstairs, you can still, you know, get up in the middle of the night and go to the toilet. But the full bathroom is downstairs. Now, that hasn't impacted on the tenants that we've had at all. Um, the tenants, the current tenants paying 650, the previous tenants were paying 650. Um, current tenants are two teachers who work in Sefton schools um, and the previous um, the previous tenants were police officers who, who worked in Tefton as well. So really good quality tenants paying sensible rents in a good area. And that's the thing. You need to know who your tenant is, who your, um, you know, who your ideal tenant is, who your ideal client is, because then you can um, create a house that suits them and what they're used to. And you can see this is in really, really good condition. So this is on the market for 130 at the moment. And you can see it's obviously um, very well looked after in occupier condition. Now, this is my one on Hawthorne. You can just see the kind of finish. So this is the downstairs bathroom with the shower above. And this is the toilet and sink upstairs. So that's quite modern compared to what was in there. This is the lounge area. So this is all the tenants furniture and what have you. Um, this is the lounge area and then this is their dining area and we put um, some patio doors in here as well to get out into the garden which is quite nice. We, um, as I say, we haven't done anything amazing to the garden, it was already paved anyway. This is the kitchen and then you can just see through that door there into the bathroom. Now this is the capital uplift bit that makes me worry, yeah? This is the artificial capital uplift because this house is now on the market for 130k and we're in May 21. Now this house that of ours we um we did buy refurb refinance on this so we bought it we did it up and then we refinanced out now the refinance figure that we requested was in um it actually completed in june 2020 so we requested it earlier on in the year just before lockdown and we requested 96,000 because that's what we thought was sensible for the market at the time and one of my friends had recently got a refinance of i think he was 92 or 94 and so i just nudged up to 96 and i was doing this the whole time and lockdown started um, and valuers couldn't get access and so they did a desktop valuation and they did agree the 96,000 and we were very very pleased with this because from a numbers point of view it meant that it was an all money out deal which which is rare now 96k for a house that looks almost identical in layout as this one except they've got the bathroom upstairs and well effectively we've got two bathrooms and there's on the market for 130. now this is the bit isn't it now it doesn't sound like a huge amount of money um, you know, it's £34,000, 
but you've got to think about it as a percentage and that's the bit where it really starts to make you think there's something not quite right here so how much is that um 34,000 is like 30 percent of that value now if we have a price drop a correction a crash whatever we have and you've paid the top top amount of money that's where it's really going to hurt so if you're not sure um, and you think, you know what, it's a sensible house and I'm 130, if I can let it for 650 and I'll have tenants that are fantastic and don't bother me and that works for you, then I'd just say lock in for a long time. Get a five year mortgage, get a 10 year mortgage if you want to, because what that will allow you to do is the only issue you're going to have if we do have a correction or a price drop is you're going to struggle when it comes to doing a refinance. Because if you've got tenants in place and they're paying the rent and the rent is paying the mortgage, it doesn't matter. You only crystallise the loss when you actually come to sell. But when you come to refinance, that can be a massive problem. So if we had a correction and you came to do refinance and the and the new lender says, actually, this house is only worth 100,000, um, they're going to expect you to put that extra 30K in. So, and have you got it? And if you don't, lock in for a longer period. Like, like make sure that you even all of those price crashes, corrections, blips, whatever you want to call them, you even it out in the long term. So I'd get a five-year mortgage, um, maybe even a seven or a 10-year mortgage. Now, the way to kind of do your homework and your research around this is obviously looking at the sold prices. So you can see here, you know, back in March of 2019, these were the comparables I was using for mine because, um, you know, this one was on for 115. Now, when I compared my property to their properties, this was an owner-occupy one. That, was, that one at the top was absolutely stunning. It was absolutely gorgeous. Uh, you know, a much higher level of refurb than we'd achieved as a buy to let model. This one down here was actually a larger house. So I'd looked into the EPC, looked at the square meterage, um, and this was a far bigger house anyway. So that's why um, I kind of nudged a little bit down to the 96 level. And then when we looked back in kind of February, 2019, you could see some of these were on the market for the likes of 80,000. This was quite normal for a long period of time. So you've got to have, you know, your, your investors head on. You've got to have your business head on when you're making these decisions. And I want you to look at the sole prices in the last six months, in the last 12 months, if necessary, but six months is better in a quarter mile radius of the house that you're looking to buy. I want you to really do your due diligence around what kind of neighborhood it is. Is it more transient? Is there more own homeowners? Is how can we predict, you know, best guess for the future? How can we mitigate losses so we can get three beds instead of two beds? That will help, um, you know, buying houses that have got options, houses that have got places to extend. Maybe you can go into the loft. Maybe you can build something out of the back. Maybe it's an end of terrace. You can deal with something up the side. We're always got to be thinking how we can mitigate any potential problems that might creep up in the future. Now, all of this kind of data is just available to you on right move. You just need to go on the sold prices. So you can see with some of these, you know, they, they were selling for 100,000 leaseholds as well. So ours is a leasehold property. Um, and then this this was the one that we kind of went off. We thought this one's on for 96. This one was on for 100. And um, we'll go in for that 96. And, and basically, we were hoping we would get it. If I had to put in 100, they could have argued us down to 90. So we were quite sensible with the with the amount of money that we requested. So your job in all of this is to constantly be looking at, you know, all the data you have available to you. I, I'm a big advocate for being lazy, like do as much desktop research as you possibly can. Do everything online before you even set foot in any of those houses to do viewings and then go and view quite a few. View 10, 12 houses to get a feel for the area, to get a feel for the size of the house and the shape of the house and the layout and all that kind of thing um, before you start throwing money at things. Don't, don't become motivated by it because this is what happens. So this is a guy from our mastermind program. Um, he was buying a house on Sydney Road, so where I told you before, within that sweet spot. I'm currently going through the purchase process for a property on Sydney Road, having agreed 85K for a three bed in good condition. It's a really, really good price. Um, it's tenanted already at 600 pound per month, and I'm ready to go. But I've had the valuation back today, and the valuation has come in at 70K. Wow, that is like, that's hard. That's a bit of pill to swallow. I'm a bit at a loss as to where to go next um, because there are a number of comparables in a quarter mile radius um, which support the price of 85K. And he really struggles with this and he actually went and got a second valuation from a different lender. He went to a different lender, got a different valuation, 70K came in again. And that is evidence of valuers who are nervous about where this market's going. 
And that is evidence to just show you that the market's moving so quickly that sometimes the valuers can't keep up with this. And the valuers are always going to use actual data. They're not looking at what's available for sale or sold subject to survey. They want the sold prices on land registry. So that's the figures that you need to work from, particularly in this part of the market um, up north. Now, a couple of little top tips, golden nuggets from Vicky. Um, one of your best insurances is a good refurbishment. So when we were looking to do our house in, um, in Hawthorne Road that you've just seen there, um, we knew that there was no way we were going to accept £550 per calendar month in rent. That was typical for the area. And we knew we weren't going to accept it because we knew we were going to create a much better property. And this is, you know, this is the kind of standard that you could see for the 550 It's just so landlordy. <laughs> I mean, this is the saddest little thing I've ever seen. Um, there isn't even a shower above the bath and that is not modern day living as far as I'm concerned. So um, we just know that when we produce a better quality asset, we always get a better quality tenant and a better quality tenant pays more rent. And that helps your return on investment. It really helps your numbers. So this was ours. We went to market at 650 um, and it was let almost instantly. So the, um, this was the very first time that we let it and um, the two tenants that came to view, they've, they were the first ones to view and within about 20 minutes of leaving the property, they'd already um, paid a holding deposit. So that was taken almost immediately. And you can see the pictures down here, you know, um, just a far better standard than the one pre than the two previously here. We got professional photographs done. We staged the house, not furniture, not asking you to start hulking beds and couches and things, but we make it homely and we give it um, some personality, something that just stands out on the pictures. Because if you do good pictures, yours will stand out on the market. And then if you can do a video tour, that kind of thing, um, it all just helps build the excitement of the tenant so that by the time they come to view, they're ready to kind of pay the whole deposit immediately. And um, one other thing I wanted to mention about um, Bootle and the north of the city is Bootle falls under Sefton Local Authority. So Sefton Local Authority have got a selective licensing scheme. Um, you can see here that it started in March 18 and it's a five year license that ends in February 23. Now, unfortunately, the downside is that it doesn't matter when you buy that license, it will still expire on the 28th of February 23. And the license is currently about £650. So it can get quite a sting in the tail, you know, if you were to buy it in like December 22, for example. So it's just one of those things you have to suck it up, you have to put it into your figures and understand, um, you know, what, what this means. You are signing up to a licensing scheme and you will get visits from the council to make sure that your house is safe and looked and well looked after. And that's all, you know, they're not looking to kind of, um, you know, do anything underhand. They want to know that you've got your electrics up to date, your gas safety certificates, that you've got, you know, sensible tenants who are not causing antisocial behaviour. Um, and I really like Sefton as a council. I think they're very um, approachable. They also give you 50% discount on your first month's vacant council tax, that kind of thing. So, you know, they, they, they can work with you quite well. Right, so here's my general tips. Okay, we're not focusing on areas now. This is um, this is more the general kinds of tips. So one thing that tends to happen is people arrive in Liverpool and tell me that they want to buy off-plan developments that they've seen um, because they've been sold in some kind of um, I don't know, like a business forum, or they've attended a networking event or something, and some guy in a shiny suit has been promising them seven, eight percent yield on city centre apartments please do not buy off plan. Um, in Liverpool, we are renowned for not building them, <laughs> for not finishing the builds for various reasons. And this is a good example of one, um, the rise in um, Liverpool city centre. So please do go and check out our blog and our website, gave you the website details before. Um, in the blog section, you can, you can use some filters and there's a filter for new build developments and it'll give you examples of this kind of thing. Things where stuff hasn't gone to plan and investors have lost an awful lot of money. So one of my mastermind members lost 250 grand um, in two separate off-plan developments, neither of which got built. Um, he's had to go through litigation to try and get some of his money back out. We had a previous mastermind member who attended the very first um, mastermind I ran and she had some family money as well. So she'd bought into a city centre apartment down in Chinatown and um, family from abroad has also sent some money over to do the same thing. She lost that as well. And um, 
she she actually didn't go down the litigation route but she was trying to work with the developers and the developers were just basically kept asking for more and more and more money and the price of the property just went up more than she ever imagined it would so please don't buy anything off plan we often don't build them we don't finish them but in addition to that um even city center apartments you do need to check things service charges will be high because they're city center and the more things that they have you know gated car parks electric lifts um, maybe they've got concierge on the desk downstairs all of that will just impact on your service charge and that comes off your profit line and um, ground rents can be high they might have something called a sinking funds which is basically to do with cyclical repairs so if you've got you know a massive big complex that needs painted every three years or you have grounds that need to be maintained or landscaped or you have um you know maybe you've got old sash windows that need to look a certain way because they're in a certain part of the city all of that kind of extra money has got to come from somewhere so they take it as a sinking fund for you know for future regeneration the other thing that started to happen in the last couple of years is a lot of the um, freeholders allowing the lease short-term lets and that doesn't bode well for you if you're trying to do single buy to lets so single buy to lets um long-term tenants they don't want to be living next door to a party house so um i'd just advise that you stay away from the city center apartments particularly other apartments might work um across the city again you've just got to do your figures on all of this and we've looked to buy more um, more apartments outside of the city center so um it can work but you've got to be careful with your numbers for my money i'd say to you if you can find a bit extra it would be far better for you to buy a whole block of flats so you can buy a big old Victorian house that's been converted into a number of units anyway, like some of the blocks that we've got. Um, or you might get something that's commercial downstairs with a couple of flats above, for example. They're really, really good. They're little cash cows when you get them operating correctly, but there is greater compliance that comes with those. So it's not for newbie investors, but it's something that you can step up to when you feel comfortable. Um, I mentioned before that your best insurance is good refurbishment. It always is. You will always get far better tenants. Um, you'll get tenants who will pay more money. Um, and it's your own asset anyway. It's a no-brainer, isn't it? You're paying good money to invest into your own property. You're not throwing this money away. It's going into something that you own. So I don't want you to compete with average. I don't want you to look at, you know, what is the average rent for the area. I want you to, to pinpoint a spot, a sweet spot for you that works a bit better. It doesn't have to be boutique, high-end finish, you know, but it shouldn't be average either. It needs to sit above average. And um, the way to do that is to just go and look on Rightmove, Zoopla, Open Rent, look at what's available for rent, find what that average looks like, and then just take the bar a little bit higher. So we go for white and grey rather than... Um, rather than that kind of magnolian and, and landlordy beach kitchens that works really well for tenants they get to put their stamp on things so their bedding their their furniture their um cushion covers all that kind of thing their vases all you know the pictures that makes a home but they always look quite carefully at kitchens and bathrooms and how good the standards you've created for those because they can't do an awful lot of those can they they're, they're kind of fixed they're tied into what you've given them and why that's also beneficial to you is because if you're able to get more rent from a tenant, then that allows you to cover the costs of maintenance quicker. So a boiler is going to cost the same amount of money to replace, whether you're charging £450 a month or £650 a month. So if you've got a new boiler that's needed um, and you're going to you know, replace it at £1,500 or something, it's going to take you a lot longer out of the tenant's rent to recoup those costs if you're only charging £450 rent compared to 650. So I'd push you to get those higher rents and tenants are happy to pay them. They're happy to pay higher rents for good quality houses. Please don't give a bad house and expect high rents. You know, it's, it's only fair that you give them a really good quality asset um, that they can look after for you. The other thing I mentioned before, so the house here, good example of it and plenty more around the city. It's better to get a house that's set back from the pavement if you can. So if you've got something like this behind a low wall or behind a fence or a bush or something, or even if it's just two or three steps up, um, those ones that are set a little bit further back are just better quality houses in general. Um, it cuts down on the amount of antisocial behaviour. Some of the um, front doors that are directly on pavements, you can have some issues with those particularly around um, high traffic areas like Anfield, you know, on the way to the stadium, for example. Um, if you can touch someone's front door, then there's a good chance that a lot of people will be touching that front door on their walk to the stadium. And it's just, you know, it's not out of malice or that, it's just silliness a lot of the time. But that three feet can make a world of difference between, um, you know, how many issues you've got externally as well as um, the type of tenants that you've got internally. 
Another thing I always say is look for the streets with the hanging baskets. So hanging baskets is, is definitely a thing. Um, a lot of our tenants who, um, and particularly in the, in the communities, the homeowner communities, a lot of our female tenants or our female homeowners, the matriarchs of the community, are very, very house proud. And you'll find that they will do things like put hanging baskets outside. Um, this has become quite fashionable, the kind of wicker hearts or um, a lot of garlands I've seen recently. So not just garlands for Christmas, but like all year round garlands, spring garlands and autumn garlands and things like that. When you see that, when, when people are happy to present to the outside world, you know, their love of their home, that is when you just know that you're just buying into an absolutely fantastic community. And look at this, next door neighbours copied. <laughs> the next door neighbours done the same thing. Um, and the same, like we put a porch on one of our properties, we put just a small, it was only a small one, um, mainly because the tenants, one of our tenants was smoking, kept catching us smoking in the house, forced outside by giving a little porch. Couple of weeks later, one of the neighbours also has a little porch outside. So it's catching, you know, you produce a nice asset. People like look up to what you've done, maybe a bit of jealousy as well. They want theirs to look just as pretty. So that benefits the whole community, doesn't it? When all the houses look good. So you can just feel a sense of community when, you, when you're stepping down some of these roads where you can see those kinds of hanging baskets and, um, and the plantation shutters as well. We've started to see a lot of these. Um, you can see the kinds of tenants that they are. They're fantastic definitely tenants that you want to um, keep in your home. So the last thing I wanted to kind of give to you is this business model and, and it's a diversified portfolio. That's what we're aiming for. So you might not be ready to buy, you know, five, 10 houses at the moment, but that's the goal. OK, um, there's, there's a bit of a sweet spot, I guess, around about 12 houses is a nice place to sit. Um, I wish I was only on 12 houses. <laughs> 12 houses is a nice place to sit because um, it's just enough. It's almost like you get paid, you know, you get paid quite a, a sensible amount of money. You don't have a huge number of issues or things like that. Um, and I don't want you to end up, you know, 100 plus houses, but 10 or 12 houses is a nice sweet spot to go to. And if you can manage it so that you end up with quite a diverse portfolio, that'll do you the world of good. So I like to use this hotel model as an explanation. Now, every good hotel knows that the customers will pay different amounts of money depends on their own context. So some guys will just come in and hang around in the bar area, just get a drink or two. So these are your kind of studio flats, your 360 to 380 per calendar month studio flats that you might have. Other people might pay a little bit extra and go and book a meal in the restaurant and you know have a five course meal, for example. And in the city that would translate to one and two bed apartments, um, you know, one and two bedroom flats dotted around. Some people might, oh, hang on. Some people might actually book a room, go and get a standard room. Um, it's not the best room in the world, but they've booked a room. They've, they've had their meal, they're staying overnight now. And this is typically your two bedroom to three bedroom houses, your 550 to 600. Nothing glitzy, nothing glamorous, and um, just good solid um, houses, good solid rentals. Some people upgrade to the club room. Some people um, aspire to have better. So this is exactly what you're trying to do. You're aiming for that 650, 675 on a three bedroom terrace. That sits quite nicely in your portfolio. And then some people go the whole hog and want to get a penthouse. And that penthouse for you could be a fantastic three bedroom house. That's boutique in style, maybe a new build house. So new builds like rent for about 800, 850 in some parts of the city. Um, and because they're new builds, they're absolutely immaculate. Or it might be that you go the other way and you get a four bedroom house, for example, you know, a bigger house instead. If you have a healthy mixture of these, then any kind of hiccups or obstacles or blips or things, it all gets balanced out overall. So, excuse me, our um, cheapest properties are £400 a month. So we don't actually have any studios, 360 to 380, but some of our one beds used to left for 380 um, back when we first started. And they've obviously, um, we've refurbished and things since then. Prices of rents have gone up. So we've got a couple of flats that are letter 400. Um, we've got we've got quite a few letters that kind of 425 to 475 per calendar month now. We've got some houses that are let around about that 500 to 525. So somewhere just in between these two. Um, we don't actually have an awful lot that lets in between here. So we've got some houses that have not had any refer for a long time. Um, and are more kind of family homes um, and I don't tend to put the rent up while a family is in situ unless I absolutely have to. So we have got some houses where um, tends to pay either 550 or 595 um, just because they've been there for absolutely ages, even though the market value of those areas might be more like 625 to 650 now. Um, the club room, we've in the last, um, I don't know, maybe the last two, two, two and a half years or so, um, this is where we've built um, quite a few properties sitting in that 650, 675 um, kind of level. 
And then the refurbishment that we're currently working on at the moment is our first four bedrooms house. Um, and that's gonna go to market at a minimum of 850. It might even go to market at 900. And that's because it's a four bedroom and it's gonna have two bathrooms as well. So um, we're gonna sit, you know, we're gonna have some properties at each of those levels in the market. And if you're targeting, you know, very low paid workers, um, tenants in receipt of housing benefit, um, people who are on zero hour contracts, maybe not permanent contracts, and you're also targeting, um, you know, young professionals who've recently left university and got, you know, a more professional job. And you're targeting um, families, you know, families that are going to stay forever. And you're targeting, um, like, one of our city centre apartments is 675. It probably should be more like 700 or 725, but he's been in for ages. He's a lecturer. Um, we've got something at all levels, and they're different types of tenants. They're different rental incomes, they're different types of tenants, they're different types of properties. It allows you to even out all those losses. Um, should there be any issues should there be any corrections should there be something like a pandemic all over again should you have tenants who really struggle to pay their rent um, we had some tenants who had to move from housing benefits over to universal credit for example that was a that was a pain um, and there was some tenants who weren't able to pay rent for a long time not because um, it was just the system it was just the admin it was just the system so they weren't able to pay rent not because they didn't want to but because their claim was getting changed over and things like that so that became problematic and if we'd have had you know 20 of those all happen at the same time we'd have took a massive hit as a business so you've got to understand that you know one can offset another and when you get to a certain size portfolio and bear in mind portfolio sounds very grand but it's only um four or more properties in terms of a mortgage lender's point of view a portfolio properties allows you to offset some issues and and it allows you to give gives you a bit of breathing space so that if one tenant stops paying you know you're not going to sweat it another tenant's income the profit from another one can can offset that issue so guys i hope that was helpful um i thought i'd just finish by explaining this to you all over again because um i absolutely adore helping investors it makes my heart sing when someone tells me that they've bought a house in our city especially one that i've kind of suggested was a good house and give some guidance around um, and we do get that quite a lot and it really really makes me so happy um and this is such a cheap way to get into our world at like an absolute no-brainer price and spend some some um time with us so today you've only had an hour's um kind of masterclass I hope that gave you a good um, little insight into what we do and how we can help. This is a five step course. So this is five weeks of live. So I'm actually interacting with you live on a one to one. You can ask me questions. You can join the discussions throughout the week in kind of written form. We have a private Facebook group where we can ask any questions at all that you need to. I'm in the group every single day, answering all of your questions, sharing links with you, showing you stuff that I've seen on Rightmove, giving you updates about um, like revaluations and things that are happening. And you get all of that in, in included as well as the course itself. So the course is five steps. It takes you from someone who doesn't really understand anything at all to somebody who will be really confident about going to place offers on properties. It talks you through how to use Rightmove as a data tool, not just for searching for houses. Um, we discuss things like the areas in Liverpool where, you know, where things work best for certain business models, certain types of houses, certain price points. We talk about how you can add value to those properties either now or in the future. I'm a great believer in that. Add value in the future. Don't do everything now. You know, keep a little kind of a, a card close to your chest that you can deal out later on. Add some value in the future when you need to refinance that property, perhaps. And then one of my all time favourite things to talk about is letting. So we end by talking about how we um, market for the right kind of tenants, how we put our properties out there in a way that the right tenants come and find us and the way that the like the tenants we don't really want self select away and in a way that the right tenants come to us because that's crucial um, you can produce a fantastic asset you can buy it in just the right place if you put the wrong tenant in the whole thing comes crumbling down okay and i've done it like don't get me wrong i'm not perfect um, and i've recently just had to reclaim a deposit that's took me four months to get um from my deposits and it and it was like it was such an achievement for me. I was like, thank God for that. It's finally gone through. And I did. I picked the wrong tenant at times, and it does happen. And they do get through the net. But my job is to try and keep you as safe as is humanly possible. So when you engage with me and you join my world, you get that access. You get access to me, but also that network of people I've um, kind of um, curated, I guess. So the next live course starts on the seventeenth of May. Um, it's the last time we're running for £99, so it's an absolute no-brainer price. Um, but the live's taken off a lot from myself and from our staff members to kind of 
um, you know, feed everything to you and make sure everyone gets what they need. And um, and the prices will go up the next time we do this. We only do it four times a year anyway. Um, so the 17th of May is the last chance to get in on this. And I would adore for you to come and join us. And um, we get such a good atmosphere in the group. You can network in the group as well. Um, it's a really good opportunity to find other people doing exactly the same thing as you. And importantly, people on the same wavelength, not those like crappy landlords who just put bog standard houses out there with really cheap finishes and ends up with shitty tenants who just trash the place and the whole thing, you know, it all falls apart. I want I want to create more communities, I want to create more communities of investors who think in the same way. Um, and that means that you're improving our whole city. That That's the goal. You improve our whole city. You improve the rental market. I can't do everything, um, but I can do it with your help and um, our tenants benefit. We have tenants. It's really, really clear, I think, from um, look at the way the pandemic's worked out. It's really clear that tenants' mental health and physical health is is closely correlated to the environment that they live in, their home environments. So I really want to push people to produce the best quality assets that they absolutely can because then tenants win. You get really good tenants and get good renting, so you win. Your asset goes up in value, so you win again. And I win because our city just looks amazing. It just benefits everyone overall. The city feels like a nice place to be. Um, and my, let's be honest, the value of my portfolio goes up as well. So I bought, you know, I was starting to buy back in 2010. So I'm, I'm benefiting from the capital uplift that you guys are creating as well. So that's my mission. I would love for you to join me. If there's anything that you're not sure about at all, please just ask in the comments below um, or send me a quick email to hello at inside-liverpool.co.uk um, or come and find me on Facebook. Come and DM me, slip into my DMs, ask any questions that you need on Facebook um, or Instagram or LinkedIn or any of those places. Otherwise, I hope that was useful. Have a really good rest of week and I'll see you all very soon.